we often think about the abolition movement beginning in the 1830s with the really famous abolitionists like William Lloyd Garrison and Frederick Douglass. Uh, but really, it goes all the way back to the colonial era. Of course, the first people to resist slavery are the enslaved Africans themselves. But in terms of white critics, uh, the earliest ones are almost always Quakers. And it's really in the 1750s when the Quakers kind of really as a, as a society, the society of friends, turn against slavery. And that's uh, largely due to the actions of two men, John Woolman of New Jersey and Anthony Benizé of uh, Pennsylvania. And uh, between 1755, uh, beginning then, the leaders of the Quakers begin to pass a series of resolutions saying the Quakers can no longer own slaves. And by 1776, most Quakers in America have accepted these rules and they've ended slavery within the society. Beginning with the American Revolution, this opens up a new opportunity for Quakers to move their anti-slavery beyond their own religious group to American society as a whole. And they begin petitioning uh, the Confederation Congress in 1783. And they petition them pretty much nonstop uh, in the ensuing decades. Abolitionists, especially black abolitionists, were uncompromising in their stance that slavery had to be ended immediately in the United States. They were far less sympathetic to early white abolitionist calls for a gradual abolition, that is sort of a piecemeal ending of slavery. But black abolitionists, people like Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth, Harriet Jacobs, John Russworm, Samuel Cornish, all of these men who really emerge as intellectual and political community leaders in northern black communities are uncompromising in their argument that slavery runs contrary to the laws of God, as well as the founding principles of the United States, the ideals of individual rights, individual freedoms. And they argue that the only way to reconcile this fundamental contradiction is simply to end slavery and to recognize all African Americans as citizens of the nation, as rights-bearing citizens. Uh, William Lloyd Garrison, like many of the other abolitionists who become prominent in the 1830s, he actually begins as a colonizationist. In the 1820s, he's a, an assistant editor for this paper called The Genius of Universal Emancipation, and it's advocating emancipation, but it also supports the idea of African colonization, that African Americans should be able to voluntarily move back to Africa. Um, but over time, um, Garrison becomes more and more radical, and he's, he's really influenced by a lot of African-American activists as well, especially David Walker, a black man from Massachusetts. In 1829, he publishes a pamphlet called An Appeal to the Citizens, uh, Colored Citizens of the World, and basically he calls on them to resist slavery and, uh, and oppose African colonization, saying, we were born in America, this is where we want to stay. And William Lloyd Garrison kind of subscribes to this view that African Americans deserve to stay in America, that's their homeland. And, uh, and he and these other, his followers, begin demanding immediate abolition rather than gradual. Um, in some ways, immediatism is a term that kind of confuses people. What they're saying is we should immediately end slavery, but they also know that's not going to happen, so they're willing to accept gradual abolition, they just want it to begin immediately. So that's, they often make that distinction. Gradual abolition immediately begun. Initially, black abolitionists have a difficult time establishing alliances and connections with white abolitionists. There's a struggle that in many ways is a struggle about sort of internal or latent racism, we might think of, on the part of white abolitionists who are not quite ready to accept black leadership in the, in the movement, who are not ready to accept black people's insistence that they are in fact capable to, of testifying to their own experiences and articulating a political agenda. William Lloyd Garrison is most notable for taking an opposite tack. Right, for recognizing the value and contributions of black leadership, not just of black men, but also of black women. What makes Garrison so radical is that he openly supports and endorses 
women's activism, white women and black women, as playing important leadership roles in the abolitionist movement. And it's Garrison's support of an interracial movement and of a movement of men and women that makes him seem so radical and even dangerous, even among some of his fellow abolitionists, that Garrison is really seen as being on the cutting edge of pushing for social change. When the Garrisonians reject African colonization, kind of the other side of that is that they embrace the idea of African Americans being integrated into American society. And they are much more vocal about granting and defending um, black civil rights, like voting. Now, some of the earlier gradual abolitionists, some of the Quakers had supported this also, but it wasn't a major part of their kind of agenda. For the, for the radical abolitionists beginning in the 1830s, uh, equal rights for black Americans is a, is a central part of the movement. 